who's going to talk about social networks in Reefus. Thanks a lot for coming. I'm going to be telling you guys about some preliminary findings from an ongoing project I'm conducting with Andrew Hine at Princeton. To begin, predation is an important force shaping the ecology and evolution of natural systems. But predators don't just eat their prey. They also do this. <laughs> predators scare the bejesus out of their prey, and this fear matters. So much so that a recent meta-analysis indicates that non-consumptive predator effects can actually outweigh consumptive predator effects on prey demographics. And the relative importance of non-consumptive predator effects can be even greater for the resources prey consume. So prey behavior and function can be affected by fear. But how do prey know to be afraid? I'll illustrate this with an example. Take this adorable blue fish. Much to his dismay, he's being pursued by a predator. And he can sense this predator through cues like visual cues or auditory cues that are produced directly by the predator. And this is what we call direct information or personal information. However, prey are often not alone, but are instead surrounded by other prey. And so in this case, whether or not our focal fish can pick up on the direct information from the predator, he can sense the predator through indirect information produced by the behavior of other prey. We call this social information. And this could be something as simple as these fish booking it and our focal fish following them because they've sensed danger. So fear can also propagate through social information. And we're beginning to see, as more and more studies reveal, that social information is a ubiquitous mechanism linking the behavior of organisms across wide spatial scales. So for example, a study using large scale sonar showed that um, herring behavior can be connected across tens of kilometers, and the waves of social information can propagate in the system at an order of magnitude faster than any fish's movement speed. Social information can also link uh, organisms across disparate taxonomic groups. So for example, in the bottom here we see uh, the Galapagos Mockingbird, which produces alarm cues that alert the marine iguana of their shared predator, the Galapagos hawk. And so social information may fundamentally shape animal behavior in nature, but it remains really challenging to measure in many systems. And one such system is tropical coral reefs the clear waters of which are home to a wide diversity of reef fishes that are highly visual, share habitat, and share predators. Now, non-consumptive predator effects on this system remain poorly understood, and the role of social information in this system remains com completely unknown, as in particular uh, how it may affect these non-consumptive effects, uh, despite the ease with which visual cues could be transmitted in the system. This led us to the hypothesis that social information shared among reef fishes affects their predator avoidance behavior. And so to test this hypothesis, we conducted an experiment on the island of Morea in French Polynesia. And the first thing we did is we constructed this massive frame out of PVC onto which we attached an array of video cameras, which allowed us to remotely and continuously monitor reef fish behavior over wide 18 square meter areas of reef. And the easiest thing about constructing this monstrosity was coming up with its name, which seemed fairly obvious. <laughs> So we constructed two of these fear frames and we deployed them in similar shallow back reef habitats. We randomly assigned them to either a control or a scare. The scare treatment was imposed with a highly standardized predator visit, which consisted of a spear fisherman swimming from a fixed distance at a fixed speed through the frame about every 12 minutes for two and a half hour daily trials. Here's a view from the prey's perspective of the ominous oncoming predator in the background. And so we did this over 14 days, alternating treatment assignments each day between sites, and this resulted in 150 scares caught on film. Just to give you an idea of what this looks like, this is kind of hard to see, but you can see some fish moving in the bottom center, and those different colored circles indicate different fish families. They all flee for their lives from the approaching spear fishermen. <laughs> and so what we've done is we've broken these videos up into three minute periods, and we recorded the initial number of fish in the frame, as well as all fish entries, into the frame and exits from the frame. So this gives us a continuous measure of the number of fish in the frame over the same time period for both our scares in red and our controls in blue. And this time period was chosen to begin the moment that the predator began swimming toward the frame at about 33 meters away. And remember, because the predator swam at a fixed pace, we know the predator's distance from the frame at any given moment in time. Um, this time period also was centered around the period in which the predator is actually physically swimming through the frame, and that's what's indicated by the gray bar here. And so this is actually just a subset of the data. We ended up with over 5,000 individual observations of fish movements, um, but the qualitative pattern remains the same. 
and that is that there is a very clear predator signal in that by the time the predator finishes swimming through the frame, all fishes exit the frame. But the timing of those exits is highly variable, and you can see the data are quite noisy. And so we were interested in looking at whether some of this variance could be attributed to social information. And so we took this period where the predator is swimming toward the frame and then through the frame, which I'll zoom in on, and we use this to our advantage. Because here we know that direct information from the predator is highly controlled and it increases with time. However, the sequence of fish entries and exits remains uncontrolled and it's highly variable across time and replicates. Uh, and just like the cartoon I showed you in the beginning of all the fish fleeing, these fish entries and exits can produce social information. And so to test whether the social information affects the, pre the, the prey behavior in our system, we tested uh, whether these observed data differ from a null data set. And this null data set preserves the direct information from the predator, but removes social information. How do we do this? Well, we produced these null time series. Uh, and we did this by randomly sampling fish entry events, indicated by pluses, or exit events, indicated by minuses, from all of our observed time series. And as we sample these events, we preserve their time signatures. And this allows us to preserve the effect of direct predator information. But by randomizing this sequence, we're removing the effect of social information. And so in this example, we're only randomly selecting from three observed time series, when in reality, we sample from over 100. And we produce 1,000 of these random time series for each observed initial fish number in the frame. And so we pull all these data together, and it gives us a null data set. And we can compare this null data set to our observed data using a metric called a run length. A run length is really simple, it's just the number of consecutive events of the same type. So in our case, we just had two types of events, fish entries in the frame and exits from the frame. Just to illustrate this, here's a time series of fish in the frame on the y-axis. The purple circle shows 10 consecutive exits, that would produce a run length of 10. The green circle to the right, which is a little harder to see, shows three fish entries, that would produce a run length of 3. And so what we can do is extract a run length distribution from our null data, shown here in blue, and this reveals the relative frequencies on the y-axis of all of the run lengths on the x-axis that you would expect if there was no social information effects in the system. Let's see what happens when we add our observed data. So we add our observed data in red, and immediately we see that these two distributions differ. First, we see that run lengths of one are observed much less frequently than you would expect based on the null model. Uh, and second, I'll illustrate this with, by zooming up on the tail, we see that in contrast, we observe run lengths of greater than one, and in particular run lengths of four and greater, more often than you would expect based on the null model. And so what this is indicating is that fishes are following each other's entry and exit behavior more than you would expect just based on direct predator information alone. And so this provides evidence in support of our hypothesis that social information affects reef fish predator avoidance behavior. With this evidence in hand, we wanted to dig a little bit deeper and to see if we can get some more detail about how this behavior is being affected by social information. And so to do this, we used a stochastic process model called a Hawks model, which allows us to model the probability that a fish will exit the frame. And this probability is based on the sum of three terms. The first term is a base probability, which is a function of time. This represents the external stimulus in the system, so in our case, that's the direct information imposed by the predator. The second two terms are uh, H and K, and they're respectively functions of past entries of fish and past exits of fish. So as I mentioned, that is social information, so that's what these terms represent. And each of these terms is a negative exponential function, and each has an alpha parameter, which describes the impact of a past event on the focal probability, as well as a beta parameter, which describes the decay and influence of a past event on the focal probability. And so you can actually think of beta as the memory of the focal fish. And so what we do is we fit a flexible set of base probability functions to our data, and we use model selection criteria to figure out which of those models best fits the data. And this allows us to begin to answer the question, how is behavior affected by social information, with the best fit model indicating that seeing another fish exit roughly doubles the probability that a focal fish will exit, and that fish remember prior exits for about 10 to 20 seconds. We were really excited about this because obviously if you can get this from just watching the videos. And so in conclusion, our data, while preliminary, are beginning to reveal that reef fish social networks 
indeed affect predator avoidance through information sharing. And in particular, fish flight is a self-exciting process. So if you're a fish, the more individuals in your network that flee, that you see, the more likely you are to flee yourself. So as it turns out, fish, like us, like to follow trends. And this suggests that the behavior of reef fish may be more interconnected across the structurally complex reef matrix than we previously believed. And the behavioral effects of predators may extend well beyond the prey that encounter these predators directly. These fear effects mediated by social information are particularly important because they may affect the function of these reef fish. And we care about that because these reef fish, as you've seen in many of these talks, they control the amount of algae and coral in the community, and ultimately the stability of the benthic community. And this is an area of research we really want to move into um, in the future rendition of this. And this is just the tip of the iceberg, this data set, because as you saw, there is a rich diversity in fish that we saw in these videos. We haven't taken advantage of that. We treated all fish as the same. But we certainly plan to go in and look at how diversity and species composition may feedback and affect social information exchange and ultimately the behavior of the network. Uh, and all of these grandiose future plans will be aided tremendously with automated image-based tracking, which we've begun to tailor to our videos. Here is an example of the first attempt. It's not perfect by any stretch, but we were told by computer vision folks that even this was going to be impossible based on sort of shoddy field conditions. Um, so we're pretty hopeful that we're going to have some uh, good success with this in the future. And with that, uh, I would like to thank first and foremost my undergraduate team, the Algonauts, who helped us amass this data set, uh, as well as the Ozenberg Lab, the Cousin Lab, Gump Research Station, and our funding sources. And thank you guys for listening, and I'm happy to take any of your questions. Way back. Yeah. Uh, do you know, well you kind of implied that maybe the, the sensory modality was vision, but do you know that? That's, a, gr have a, you know, that's a great have question. A we, it's a great question. Way. We don't know. Um, we made every attempt to be silent with the approaches to try to reduce auditory or um, uh, movement um, stimuli that might also be in place. So we're really trying our best to isolate visual, but we can't know for sure. social information from just the school information. The fact that you might have four or five fish that just can do the same together, independent of the fact that one is communicating. Fair enough. So I would say that that is social information. That schooling behavior is a result of social information. So, there's, so the answer is there's no way to distinguish it. But I would say that that schooling behavior is the manifestation of social information. Does that make sense? So then can you, can you just relate that directly to school size then? I'm sorry, I didn't hear the very last part. So, so you said something about um, you've got uh, groups of four or five fish that act almost synchronously or very close together. Right, the run lengths, right. Yeah, exactly. Right. Is that the average school size? Uh, that's a good question. Um, we haven't evaluated that in any way. Generally, there's usually 10 to, to 15 fish at the higher end. Um, but it's hard to say because this is a wide area. And um, that's a good question. It'd be something to look into because there certainly clump, there appears to be clumping amongst the fish. So that is that is definitely a possibility. Yes. Great talk. I, I really like it, Thanks. especially because it doesn't make me look like an idiot. Um, <laughs> uh, have you have you noticed any any fin flicking of these fish? So just rapid movements with their dorsal dorsal fins, because that's what I what I noticed with the rabbit fish they do, and that's I think the way they communicate. So that. I don't know if you noticed anything, but that might be something. Like a dorsal fin? Or yeah, so they just do a little, little flick with their dorsal fins, and I think that produces a sound that actually alerts the partner. Huh. So if, if these fish in the groups do something similar, right. that might be a way that they could alert, alert other fish beyond just visual, visual sort of monitoring, because right. monitoring your, your group members, if you want, is, is costly because then you can't focus on, on foraging. So if you have other means of, of monitoring that, that might be something. That's interesting. We haven't seen anything like that. It, actually, rabbit fish are incredibly rare. Yeah. It's overwhelmingly dominated by echinoderms and scarabs, yeah. but that's something that's interesting to think about. Well, chat after. Yeah, awesome. Thanks. So, oh, do I have time for one more? Yeah, we Okay, we can chat after. Thanks.
All right.